Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Alexander Exer. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my presentation today is centered around the mindset, uh, the culture, and the language around zero defect. Uh, I am uh, excited about this audience and uh, the engagement with folks that work in manufacturing world. I see some of my peers here that that's what you do every day. Go out there and build a product that is uh, moving fast throughout the production flow, but also moving accurately. So the challenge is, what are the key factors we have to be aware of, invest in, control, uh, and either eliminate the variations or control them throughout the flow so we can sustain and predict uh, speed and accuracy in how we do the work. Now, whether you are in the commercial business where I spent half of my career, or you're in, a, you're in the uh, military defense business, uh, the, the basic promise of a speed and accuracy going hand to hand doesn't change. Also, the notion of zero defect. Uh, zero defect, uh, look, I'm an engineer just like all the rest of us. I said, really, is zero, zero? The answer is yes, it is zero. You don't walk into the hospital that says, you know, I have a 95% success factor, all right? You don't go on the airline and fly around the world that says, oh, trust me, 99% of the time, I have a successful takeoff and landing. You target zero incident, zero escape, zero defect, and then invest in culture, language, process, technology, and discipline to enable it. Now, is it possible that time to time, there is escape of some random effect that you may have not thought about? Yes, that's possible. But you don't start with that in mind to uh, invest in your processes and capabilities. So on that note, let me uh, start with the overview of the company, how we define zero defect, how we invest in zero defect, what kind of a, a results we have been able to obtain to this date, and what the future looks like. First about uh, the company. <clears throat> As you can see, we're all over the world. We have uh, many operations in the United States, several operations overseas. Uh, in Europe, uh, in Asia, and it continues to expand. Um, uh, you look at uh, the platforms, uh, F-35s, that is invested by many international partners and anticipate the future growth of that platforms in sustainment and manufacturing content and local capabilities to become and continues to become a real global uh, treasure with, uh, with all of our partner countries. But not only that, we look at F-16, uh, C-130, platforms that requires continuous support and sustainment. In some cases, we have a local content, local manufacturing capabilities that, again, uh, begs the need for this continuous engagement in technology and innovations. These are the platforms. Uh, it's unbelievable how you have platforms that goes back to 1960s that still, to this day, is considered the most robust, dependable uh, capability for reconnaissance. You too, you look at C5. When C5 lands in the tarmac in Marietta, it's like tired, it's falling apart, it's been going around, it's like giant mall. Oh. Our people get it back together, give it a nice rub, make it look happy and smiling and flies around for another. It's unbelievable when you watch this thing, it doesn't look like it's moving. And then you have C-130, the sweetheart of the, recon uh, of the air mobilities. And I talk to a lot of warfighters that use C-130. It's unbelievable aircraft. It does just about everything. And then the fighter groups and so on and so forth. So I'm, if it's not obvious, I'm very proud of our products. This is where we operate. This is where we are, everywhere. Supply chain, we have, in our operations, we have over 1,200 suppliers distributed around the world. And 70% of what goes into the aircraft comes from suppliers around the world. So do the math. Take 1,200 suppliers and then do a quick math. How many sub-tiers they are depending on getting the work done in order to send it. We have suppliers, we have main contractors that farm out 90% of the contract they receive from us to their sub-tiers. So when you're, in, when you're thinking about 
the accumulation of all the variation, all the excess is massive. That's where the challenge is. That's how you ought to really connect all the dots, establish a policy, language, understanding, reward mechanism that enables and encourages the right behavior and absolutely filter out things that you don't want to come uh, onto the aircraft. So this is also very timely because as you are paying attention to what's going on in our environment, the budget at the defense level is continuing to get challenged. Now I know just recently in a week or so we heard there is an attempt to increase budget by some factors. But that doesn't change the fact that we have warfighters facing unanticipated missions, unbudgeted missions that they have to respond to in real time and they don't always have the, the, the technology and the capabilities available to them at the point of conducting the mission. And this, this puts an enormous amount of pressure on our government to look at the, the value of investing the capitals in technologies and capabilities that enables our warfighters to go out there and conduct the mission, which means the money has to come from somewhere. You have to uh, provide efficiency and affordability. You also have to move the money from various areas that may not be as crucial as, as urgent in order to support the warfighters' needs. But the fact remains the demand on the budget compared to demand of the capabilities are out of sync. And that's just the fact, okay? So I have to do math if I didn't do math you wouldn't be very happy with me today. So let's do a little bit of math. Y is a function of X. If we say Y is lasting value, what our customer is asking us, lasting value looks like C5, C130, F16, U2. It gets designed, it goes out there, conducts the mission, comes back, you uh, provide service, it continues to provide the capabilities all around the world. Lasting value can be explained in three components. And as you can see at the bottom of the chart, I actually developed this back in 2009, trying to help connecting the dots of what the lasting value uh, may be represented by these three factors. One is the, your typical reliability, which is a product of technical solution and robust processes. Then it's a zero defect results, which is a product of reliability and personal accountability. Interestingly enough, we're on a big journey about culture of accountability in our company to reinforce that message. Because we do have a very reliable products. The key is paying attention to the details day in, day out at every step of the way. And don't think just manufacturing. I know we're in a manufacturing seminar. But think about contract language. You can have a wrong contract and be a non-conforming product forever. Think about human resource processes. Think about IT. It's a mindset and the culture. That's why the presentation is about zero defect mindset. It's not just in the factory. It doesn't start in the factory. It starts from the beginning of the business all the way through. And then lasting value is to be able to to, to be able to perform to that zero defect uh, uh, performance level and pass the test of time on an ongoing basis. So this is where we have to standardize, systemize, formalize, stabilize ideas that helps us to achieve zero defect. So generation after generations where people come in and we move on, they can uh, still sustain that performance. Those are the three components that defines zero defect the lasting value. As far as what do you invest in, the research will show you that no matter what kind of companies you have, no matter what size companies you have, for profit, for nonprofit, in technology or service, the four invested capitals are, are constant. Human capital, organizational system and a structure, customer intimacy and innovations. These four capitals interact with one another. And when, when you have these capitals constantly calibrated to perform to the expected results that is set either by customer, contract, or by market, 
you have the ability to turn the knobs, increase, change, and what have you. To expand on the four capitals, in our business, because it's a defense acquisition, every product we deliver is delivered through a program of some kind. I'll show you some additional charts to help understand what, what I mean with that. This is a slightly different market than the commercial world because we don't have a distribution channel. We have a contract, we have a contract funding that has been approved by the government. It has a specific application for that funding. If it's for design, it can only be spent on design. You can't borrow design money to do manufacturing. Okay, if it's for manufacturing, you can't borrow that money to do sustainment. These are well-defined funding and it, it allows us to invest in the various capitals of the four that I mentioned in order to execute. But the way we measure our performance is actually pretty straightforward. Deliver on time, deliver on budget, and meet the quality requirements. Those are the three measurements that defense acquisition system measures us to. SPI, CPR, and then customer satisfaction that we call uh, CPAR, customer feedback, which includes quality, technology, and so forth. So regardless of what investment we make, at the end of the day, the adjudication of the goodness of our investment, the wisdom of our investment, it's measured in a program performance, one program at a time. This is different than the commercial world, and a lot of our peers that come from commercial world help us connect the dots between best practices in both worlds and understand how we borrow from a speed and agility of the commercial environment and how we comply with the regulatory and governing aspects of the defense structure. It's a great synergy between the two industries, two markets. Here's what I just said to you. We have a PMO, program manager of record, that is assigned by the government to handle a program of record. In this case, let's pick F-35. We have a program manager that is identified by the company to interact with the government program manager. These two individuals have, on the company side, they have access to the capital investments, such as what we talked about earlier, human capital, organizational system and structure, customer intimacy, and innovation. These investments are invested by the com company, and they made available to the program manager for this program. They interface with the government program manager, who is also looking at the warfighter and the warfighter's need. This structure creates a degree of complexity that has to be monitored through the funding management, execution, earn value, and what have you. What you don't see here is a distribution channel. You don't see something in there labeled as Best Buy or Home Depot. We don't put our aircrafts in Best Buy or Home Depot. That's a distribution channel. We don't have it. And because of that regulations, we can't price it based on the commercial world, which is a value pricing. A value pricing is an iPhone that costs 20 bucks, but you pay $600 for it. That's called value pricing. You have an option, buy Samsung, okay? In our business, we have a cap. We can't exceed a certain amount of earning. There is not real fast and hard roll in there. There is no rule that says we couldn't, but you don't find defense companies making a 65, 75% gross margins. If you make it, you make it one time, okay? All right? So that's why it's important for the suppliers to understand that. You may be a provider of cuts, commercial off-the-shelf products, and we may be very a small portion of your product. But check this out. If I buy 100 and 97 of them work, the other three comes out of my profits. I don't get to place 103 because math says only 100 of them work. I have a fixed amount of dollars that I am authorized to spend. I can't have excess inventory on my uh, shelves because I know how to predict the performance. The predicting of the performance is not the issue, but being able to fund it it flies against the regulatory requirements that we're obligated to comply to. We get audited. We have to show our books. We have to show that we spend the money according to the contract terms. 
As simple as that. So when we talk to our suppliers and say, folks, if you have bad news, give us that bad news sooner. We can help you. We can come out there and help you overcome that bad news. But the time it gets and sits on the shelf, it gets on the aircraft, now you have had such a huge ripple effect. A $5 pin can hold a $100 million aircraft. It's plain and simple as that. So that's the zero defect mindset that we have to inspire. So set the requirements. We talk about define the customer requirements, identify right investments, make sure there's structure in place. If you bring best and brightest people, I appreciate the presentation earlier about the talent and emerging talent, but, but remember, when the talent comes into the factory or into the operation, they're excited. They want to know what their job is, what they can do, how they impact the work within the first 30 minutes. We can't abandon them in the cubicle and say, we'll get to you six weeks later. Starting the second day, they'd be in the Google looking for another job. Okay? So when we bring the talent with the exciting energy to help us with shaping the future, we got to pay attention and connect them to the business right away. The flip side of that is once you connect the talent to the business, you have to give them the tools to do the job. The greatest, the greatest return on human capital is when the talent has the process and tools to have the impact. If they don't have the process and tools to have the impact, the human capital is diminished, plain and simple. This shows you some results over the last few years, 2011. We started the war on defects. Our outgoing product quality level when we started this was a, it's a measure of ANSI standards. How many latent escapes we find 90 days after the transfer of ownership of the aircraft to the customer? First of all, you should know, it's not a contract requirement, okay? It's an industry best practice. My teacher, Dr. Joran, would say is a piece of gold nugget of knowledge. That's why we started the measurement after 90 days of shipping the aircraft, look for even minor scratches that requires touch-up. And we captured that, 25 on average per tail. We took care of it, we fixed it. You know, knobs coming loose, seats getting loose, little scratches. Today is 0.46, 0.46. 0.46, and it has been around 0.46 on and on and on. The very first F-35, now I'm not talking about F-35. I know the F-35 is a big name, but what I'm talking about all the platforms, platforms that go back 30, 40 years. The very first um, F-35 zero defect aircraft that arrived to Edwards, they went through it with a fine tooth comb and they called the commander here. There was a lot of high fives and uh, cheering about, oh my God, we have a zero defect landing. Code one, zero defect landing. I keep track of all of those. And there was a lot of excitement. Today, there's no excitement. It's the new reality. It's expected. So that's the improvement we made as far as outgoing product quality. Let me also show you the incoming material. We started with 15,000, roughly about 15,000 escapes from our suppliers into the factory. We work with them across the world on zero defect plan. We spend a lot of time with them. We continue to do that today. Let me explain what that means. For instance, I have spent nine consecutive weeks rolling up my sleeves on the floor in one of our suppliers living there for nine weeks. That's what we talk about when we say we spend time with them. All my peers here spend a lot of time with the suppliers, directly and indirectly, to help connecting the dots, engaging with technology, the expectations, the standards, and help them be successful. We have dropped the defects from 15,000 per year to 3,000. Now let's compare that to what we ship. The 3,000 defects that are coming into the factory, it's an outgoing product quality level 
of the 1,200 suppliers into my factory. What I am shipping is 0.46 escape to the field. So we are interrupted 3,000 times in order to produce a zero defect aircraft. That's where the issue is. That's where we, re we run delays in cost and the efficiencies and affordability opportunities are right there. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, those 3,000 escapes are not all done by themselves. There are a lot of factors involved. Some of it comes back to us. We have to adjust the design, adjust the tooling, flow down requirements. Some of it is their sub tiers, but doesn't change the fact that 3,000 times we get interrupted in order to produce a zero defect aircraft, okay? And I think that wraps up my, I think that's the last chair. I'll stop here and see if you have any questions. So I've had some questions coming in. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask you some of them. Um, how can we stimulate greater innovation and flexibility in defense manufacturing? Okay, actually that's a very, very uh, important topic. Very, uh, I'm very involved with that on the quality technology side of it, but quality technology and manufacturing technology go hand to hand. Uh, bringing ideas forward. Look, looking for those ideas is not always easy. That's part of the issue. So imagine if there was a website that says manufacturing technology for defense application A to Z, everything and anything you want to see. You go in there and start searching, do a one-stop shopping. Today, I have manufacturing quality engineering technologists that are out there searching for information. And given the type of days you have, given all the moving parts in our agendas, unless you put a lot of focus in it, just finding the information is hard. So if I ask how many people know the drone technology to do an aircraft shake, this should be very easy to find. They should be able to go to a website and say, here's all the drone technology, aircraft shake, a DOD qualified, you know, hardened, capable, and here's the price structure. Just like Amazon, if I want to buy something or rent a movie, Go to Amazon, one-stop shopping. We don't have that. It becomes a science project, and any time you have a science project, you're taking a risk of losing momentum and not stay with it, and so forth and so on. So the, the answer to the question is, technologists that have something to offer get together and create a one-stop shopping place for all of us. Help us out. Okay, thanks. Another question is, some of some of your product lines are going to run for 40 or 50 years right. and um, which which makes aerospace and defense a great business to be in but do you expect ongoing quality improvements from your suppliers as regulations change as technology advances are you expecting them to continue to supply you with the same spare parts or is there um, an expectation for quality improvement keeping up with the technology? The answer is yes and yes. We, the quality performance is a journey. It's a continuous improvement for life. And you look at, you compare our, our market to the medical market. We have had innovations after innovation, breakthroughs after breakthroughs. Things that would have affected our quality of our lives 15, 20 years ago, now they, they are manageable. So regulations hasn't changed. FDA GMP regulations today was the same FDA GMP regulations of 20, 30 years ago. Our standards, federal acquisition regulation standards and all the standards that comes up with that isn't gonna change that much that frequently. But think about it this way. If you're producing a product and you find a way to improve the performance of that product through technology and innovation, that should make your business a stronger. You should be able to generate more bottom line results and grow your market share. So whether I expect you to do that or not, you should ask yourself, 
why wouldn't I invest in continuous improvement? It's just nothing but goodness for the company. And of course, over the next 30, 40 years, we expect, we expect those parts to be available where they need to be available and work every single time where they need to go. That's a challenge that ties to configuration management, that ties to their legacy management, and those are internal processes that companies have to you know, invest in. You look at C5, C5 and C130, they're using parts, brackets, uh, pistons, uh, piece parts that were designed 30, 40 years ago. But they're still available, they still allow the aircraft to get uh, put back together and go conduct the missions. So the answer is absolutely yes. This is not gonna stop, and it's not gonna stop with this government, this administration, or the next government, next administration. It's a continuous improvement, continuous investment. Um, I a few weeks ago, the SME Board of Directors had the opportunity to tour your, your plant and see the F-35 being built. So that's a truly international program, all of the various flags on the wall. Does that provide any really unique challenges to you in terms of truly global supply chain, global customers, varying expectations? Absolutely. How, how do you juggle that? Absolutely. It, uh, the, the challenge is anywhere from basic language. Uh, if, if you didn't detect from my accent, I speak more than one language. I can tell you that a simple direct translation of English to another language sometimes doesn't get the message across in a way you want it to get across. The expressions, the subtleties, the details are important. So language, culture, culture. If you're doing business in Italy, for example, you're not dealing with a capitalistic system. You're dealing with a social democratic system or in Germany or in parts of Europe. So what motivates to float our boat doesn't necessarily motivate some of these international partners. You have to come at engagement with the cultural continuity that enables them to understand where you're coming from. Then you also have all the foreign uh, sources of components, lower tier components that they could be made places around the world you don't even know. That they get flown up to the distribution houses, you buy from distribution houses. They don't necessarily have controls of every single piece parts everywhere around the world but we still bear the responsibility to make sure what goes on the aircraft meets the requirements is safe. So it's a challenge, international global market, it's a challenge, but it also provides richness, ideas and innovations that comes true by engaging with the various countries around the world. So I had an engineer, for example, that came out of Fiat, working for us in Italy, in our operation in Italy. What he brought with him was unbelievable knowledge, not just because of automotive industry, but automotive industry in highly competitive market in fiat. So he had perspectives and ideas that really you know, provided us with different dimensions, with different perspective we learned from. So I think is positive. I think it's gonna continue to grow our mental capacity and our intellectual capacity, but at the same time, we go in other countries' backyard and we want to invest and have a local content, we have to take the time to understand how to engage with them, how to work with them, how to help them out. So, okay. Thank you. Um, I think a, a lot of us here have, you know, where we've worked in manufacturing, engineering, some of us have worked on the shop floor and plants, and different, different companies and industries have a different philosophy around the relationship between quality professionals and manufacturing. Um, in some cases, quality works for manufacturing. In some cases, people think that's the fox watching the hen house and that we need to sort that out. What, what do you think the ideal relationship is between the quality function and the manufacturing function? In, in our market, in the defense market, quality has uh, two major components. One is the governance under federal regulation regula uh, requirements. They have to provide the governing function uh, to oversee the compliance to the standards. 
The second function is to enable effectiveness and efficiency in speed and accuracy, which is more of a commercial side of it. Frankly, if you have a quality organization that is based on a very professional application of science of quality, not centered around inspection per se and alone, but also science of, of quality when you invest in variation control, front end design, engagement, manufacturing will only be one, one partner you work with. You will be involved in pursuing new businesses, making sure the quality of bid proposal doesn't get you in trouble, transactional quality. You're involved in the contract formation to make sure the language of the contract doesn't obligate you to things you can't commit and build and deliver. You'll be involved in the quality of a program a startup. You'll be involved in the quality of human resource processes. By the way, we have quality engineers today in Aero, in HR, in program management, in contract, in IT, and in uh, demand planning and supply chain transactional parts for those reasons. Because the white collar area of the business has more opportunities for saving and efficiencies that factory that only has 30% of the content. In fact, many, many of the challenges that we discover in the factory floor are created in the white collar offices. So when you put it in that context, quality should be a competitive discriminator as part of your organization. It should be irrelevant in terms of are they nested with production or nested with engineering. As soon as you start nesting them, you're diminishing your competitive position. What I like to see is a quality organization represented by one person, but one person that has a caring voice, presence and influence to effect decision making. Then the rest, we have 25,000 employees in Aero. There should be 25,000 quality professionals, whether they do design or HR or manufacturing or services, no one knows how to do it right the first time but the person that does the work. So I am the opponent of reducing dependency of somebody else to come and check you to make sure you've done it right. Mm -hmm. We still have a lot of maturity phases to get to that point, but what I'm saying is not theoretical. Companies have done that. In fact, I have not done in my In my career, when I was running manufacturing operations, we didn't depend on inspection to catch this stuff. It was baked into the flow of the process. So take a look at where you are company-wise, the level of maturity. If your business president says, I am the chief quality officer, you may have an opportunity to get that fully in integrated in all aspects of your business, front to the end. That's my answer. Great. Thank you, Alex. When I read the title of your presentation today, Zero Defect Mentality at the Global Supply Chain Level, I had to ask myself, who isn't all for that? Right. Especially in airplanes. Exactly. Um, so I want to thank you on behalf of SME for being here today and being our keynote speaker. I have a plaque for you. Thank you. To express our appreciation. To express our appreciation. And somewhere there's a photographer who's going to scoot over and take a picture. Okay. Or if you stand on the, stand on the landing strip. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.